bum 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 bum
really leans into the idea of just being a human being on this planet is is really just such a wonderful gift. And I guess this is a good place to mention that this will be a full spoilers conversation regarding the first six issues of Transformers. We won't spoil issue seven within our conversation with Danny Warren Johnson, but maybe at some point in our chat with each other, we may talk a little bit about where he's going or where it looks like he's going based on issue seven. And the thing that we love about Danny Warren Johnson comics is that they look rad, mm -hmm. right? They are the most badass looking comics around, but at their core is always a story about human connection. And when we were first talking to Dan about this book, uh, both on and off the record, we were trying to figure out, okay, what is the human story? And human's not the right word, but like, you know, the, the sentient story. Like when I'm talking about humanity, I'm also talking about the humanity of the Autobots and the Decepticons. But what is the human story at the heart of this Transformers book? And maybe because of my own biases, I assumed this was going to be a story about Spike and Optimus Prime. Even after I read that first issue, and that first issue clearly has all these indicators that this is actually Sparky and Optimus Prime story, I was convinced it was Spike's story. But after he gets shot in the crossfire in issue three... We told you this was going to be a spoiler-filled episode. Do you think we're playing? I started writing this other story about, oh, it's actually going to be about... A father who loses a son, Sparky, and a daughter who loses a dad, Carly. And I did that whole fanboy thing where I write my own story. I now have expectations. Those expectations are not met in issue six. And I was like, oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And it wasn't until I reread all six issues as one piece. And you really do see from the very first page Daniel Warren Johnson telegraphing this as a Sparky and Prime book that I ultimately really fell in love with his Transformers. But isn't that just the romance and heartbreak of reading comics? Like, you set up all of this anticipation before you even read the first issue. And then you read it month to month. And in yeah. those intervening weeks, you can really set yourself up for some disappointment yeah. with all of like ooh, the story that you're writing in your head. Yeah, all that anticipation starts piling up. And expectations are the enemy of yes. a good time. But then like you get your six issues, you kind of process those feelings, and then you get the trade and you read it again and your entire relationship to the story changes. Yeah, yeah. So if you go back and you look at the first issue of Danny Warren Johnson and Mike Spicer's Transformers. And that first page in particular, where we are seeing flashes of memory, both belonging to Sparky and Optimus Prime. We see these war images. Sparky was a combat veteran. We see him leaning over a fallen comrade. We see the arc collapsing, colliding towards Earth. Optimus Prime is in ruin. And we see the shuttle carrying Jimmy, Sparky's eldest son, to his doom. So when we meet these two characters, they are at their lowest point. And Sparky is trapped in all of his grief. And this story ultimately becomes about these two beings helping each other out of their despair. I feel like the flashes at the beginning of issue one have less to do with like equal despair and more to do with a history that mirrors each other. And I do feel like they do get to a place of equal despair, but moving from completely opposite directions. Yeah, and I mean, and Optimus Prime hits his despair towards the end of the series. Right. So I said there, it starts in equal despair, but that's not necessarily true. Like the despair begins in the first issue when Jetfire arrives on Earth from Void Rivals. Mm -hmm, you know, that's where mm -hmm. he first came in from the Kirkman and De Felice book. And for Jetfire, the Cybertron war hasn't even happened. You know, he's still buddies with Starscream. So when he rekindles Teletron 1, he's expecting a warm welcome, but Starscream has been corrupted 
by the centuries of hate that has been born out of this war. Starscream blasts Jetfire, and Jetfire ultimately dies in Optimus's arms, and as he's dying, he's expressing his despair. I have failed. Cybertron will die. What was it all for? And Optimus, being a being of hope, mm -hmm. says, I will show you. Like, there is still hope until he's on death's door at the end of the series and he's taking out the matrix of leadership and trying to pass it off to another Autobot and dies in mid relay. And it is hard to see Optimus die with despair in his heart. And then it gets rekindled by Sparky's action. I often find myself thinking about Brene Brown's definition of hope, of hope being a cognitive process mm. You have hope when you can make a plan to get out of your despair. It's, it's knowing what's going to happen next. It's that feeling of autonomy. I have the tools to move towards a better future. And logically then, despair is that lack of answers, that lack of tools and processes to change anything. So when Optimus brings the Autobots on the Ark to Earth, that is an act of hope. That's what he says to Jetfire. Like, I brought us here because we can find a new way. We can find a way out of this war. And then because the Decepticons followed them there, you know, and, and all this horror happens over the course of these six issues and he is fatally wounded, you know, there is no future for Optimus at that point and he loses possibility. And I also think that he is consumed by doubt that like going principles first over survival actually served the Transformers and the humans. Like if there's no hope for either, like if there's no future for either, was every choice he made before that just a long running mistake? And I think that this is where the despair of Sparky and the despair of Optimus Prime meet because Sparky ha was already coming from this place of every decision I ever made was a mistake because I lost Jimmy. Yeah. And I can't live with this pain. And now I have this second son that, like, whenever I have a clear thought about him, I am just so afraid he's going to die. Yeah. Right? So, like, to me, Sparky's story, Sparky's, like, life thesis statement starts when he is in the bar and Spike comes in and Spike has his telescope because, you know, going out and thinking about outer space and becoming an astronaut is what helps him feel close to his brother. And Sparky replies, when are you going to grow up? And I think we spend a lot of these issues with Sparky kind of getting his head around what he thinks growing up is. And I think from his vantage point of just being in this incredibly low place is growing up is giving up on hopes and dreams. Mm. You know what I mean? Giving up on believing that there is, there is an opportunity for everything to turn out right. What complicates matters though, Lisa, is that when Sparky does sacrifice himself and step into the matrix of leadership, effectively rekindling it and bringing Optimus Prime back to life, this is a moment that he has been waiting for for a very long time. We go back to his war and he has said he wished he could take the place of his fallen comrades. We look at Jimmy and he said that he wishes he could have taken the place of Jimmy and now here he is with Optimus and he goes it's better for me to die and Optimus to live therefore here's my chance to take the place of a dying person and he does it and that makes me like really uncomfortable in a lot of ways it makes me really uncomfortable too like one of my least favorite tropes in fiction is redemption through giving yourself, giving your life for another person's life, doing a one-to-one -one trade, or even a one-to-a-million trade. Like, I just, I just don't like the idea of someone living their life standing outside of an elevator door waiting for it to open. Yeah, you know what I mean? I do. That the way out of despair is to stop feeling. So, like, I felt like the only way that I could 
reconcile this story for myself is to make it so that is that that is not what Sparky did. You know, in this interview, you can hear me kind of trying to work that out with Daniel because to me that scene parallels the scene in which the Decepticons are cannibalizing Skywarp yeah. for parts so that they can t- continue to live. Like I love how clear Dan makes the difference between Autobots and Decepticons because you'll hear in this interview as well. To me, the names don't help. You know what I mean? Like that, That's where you're, you, if you had a little nostalgia for the names, <laughs> you would remember <laughs> them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Decepticons believe in survival over all other things, survival of the fittest. So the idea of going to a planet and harvesting it for Energon and leaving it in ruins like makes a lot of sense for them because because they are stronger they are more entitled where the Autobots believe in the survival of the principle of caring the principle of honoring life. Certainly Optimus Prime. We see in these issues that Ratchet, Cliff Jumper, they're not as, um, like, their power is not caring the way caring is a power for Optimus Prime. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? Like, survival of the fittest doesn't work in every single situation, but... Preserving the life of every living thing above all other things is not going to work all of the time. I mean, like, we hate the idea of Decepticons coming to our planet and extinguishing the human race, but we will exterminate the ants in our kitchen, you know? I think that the revelation for me with this story is that I can see where the Decepticons are coming from. (laughs) And Ratchet can see where the Decepticons are coming from. And at his end, Optimus Prime can see where the Decepticons are, are coming from. Because when we are all blinked out of existence and there's nothing left, what was the point? Yeah, so the wobbliness of the morality in this comic is absolutely intriguing and complicated. But for me the clear love that Daniel Warren Johnson has for Optimus Prime's principles, his ability to care. Like, you look at that second issue where he steps off the arc and the ground, you know, leaves... The ground is scarred by his tread, and then he accidentally steps on that deer and crushes it, and he sees the frailty of this planet... And it's beautiful and terrifying at the same time. And when that happens to him, when he takes the life of the deer, he cannot bear to think that he would do that again to another creature. And he's willing to sacrifice his comfort and the comfort of his Autobots to protect this incredibly brittle planet. And that is the heroism that Daniel Warren Johnson is reveling in with this series. I think like more than we realize, the decisions that we make have a lot to do with cost. What does hoping cost? What does loving cost? What does being selfish cost? And I think that we're waiting for an outcome to this math problem that we never actually get to fully see or experience, at least in this life. And I feel like with Transformers and and meditating on the story of Sparky and Optimus Prime helps refocus our our energy or our mathiness to like what is the present worth? You know, what what are we losing or missing because we are in service to an outcome that like, actually we can't control. Yeah. And here we have Daniel Warren Johnson in the middle of a press blitz. You know, I think when we spoke to him, we were the second, the last 
interview that he was a part of. And here he comes walking into our Zoom room and Brad and Lisa have these massive questions about life, the meaning of it, and all our our doubts and fears. And yeah, okay, you know, Transformers is also just a really fun and cool comic. Yeah, a robot <laughs> rips off his arm and hits another guy with it. Yeah, yeah, there are so many amazing splash pages. The action in this is unparalleled like it is with every Danny Warren Johnson comic. And I hear some people find that entertaining. <laughs> but Lisa and I are worried. <laughs> <laughs> and we're using Transformers to calm those worries. And I would argue that the human condition is using the Transformers to calm those worries. It's not like we think that Daniel Warren Johnson has the answers to these things, but like to me, his story is telling me that he wants to have the conversation and everybody loving these comics wants to have the conversation whether we know it or not. But before we have that conversation with Daniel Warren Johnson, Lisa, we need to do some... Referrals! Sponsored by Omnibus. Omnibus is a modern digital comic book store and reader app carrying your favorite single issues, volumes, and omnibuses all day and date. Just like your local comic book store, you pay per book, but digital. Their focus is on building an excellent customer shopping and reading experience and using novel discovery features to help fans find their next new favorite book. They feature top tier content and already have many of the top publishers in comics today. In the spirit of helping people find their next new favorite book, we have our referrals segment. The idea is to give our counselees, that's you guys, further reading on the themes of the episode. Think of it as us sending you to specialists to further your healing journey through comic books. So for me, this referral segment was rather easy because I just want to direct our listeners and Transformers fans to the rest of the Energon universe. While it's easy to read Transformers, without reading Cobra Commander, Duke, and Void Rivals, I do think you're missing out on a total experience. Uh, you know, Void Rivals is where everything kicks off, but Void Rivals has a very different tone, a very different story. It has a great relationship at the center of its saga between Derek and Salila, and it goes into some realms that, I mean, it has some deep cuts that Transformers fans need to witness. And go straight over my head. <laughs> like, I can feel the wind on my face Lisa of references I'm not no understanding. no idea what a quintessence is, but I do, and you listening do, and my goodness, could you imagine Lorenzo De Felice illustrating a quintessence? Yes, you can, and now you can see it in Void Rivals. And Joshua Williamson and Tom Riley with Duke are doing something very different from Transformers. Even though you get to see Tom Riley illustrate his version of Starscream at one point, his version of Optimus Prime. Duke is in the second issue of Transformers and he has his mind blown when Starscream transforms in front of him. And, you know, with that mind exploded, he's trying to pick up all the pieces and make sense. What has the government been hiding from him? And it sends him on this saga towards Destro and the Mars Corporation and again, like the action in Duke is top tier. And Cobra Commander is maybe the most insane issue, uh, insane series of the lot. I'm not going to spoil where Cobra Commander goes, but it goes places that I never, ever would have imagined Skybound would have taken the Energon universe. And I'm so excited to see how that wraps up with issue five. All of these issues are available on Omnibus and they are worth your time. Worth your time. Here you are. You're still in your head about the cost of things. What about the value of the present, Brad? <laughs> but speaking of things that are worth your time, spend some time on this, getting into the other works of Daniel Warren Johnson. I feel like Transformers is a great introduction to his work, but I think that you only get a sliver, just yeah. a facet of how tremendously creative and thoughtful and introspective he is. And I do get the impression that Transformers is bringing a lot of new readers to Daniel Warren Johnson. And I am so grateful. I'm grateful because they are wonderful. And on the Omnibus app, you can find both Extremity and do a power bomb, both of which are great, but I think I'm going to use as my more focused referral do a power bomb because there are some cross pollinated ideas in both of these stories. Both Transformers and do a power bomb 
start in a realm of like fandom and nostalgia that I do not exist in. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't care about Transformers or I didn't until I read these books. And I have only just recently cared about pro wrestling and only like on a very surface level, like I'm like, I'm not in it. I'm not in it. But Do a Power Bomb is about a daughter whose mother died in the ring. An alien invites her to another planet to fight in the hopes of getting her mother back, bringing her mother back to life. And to me, it is almost like the other side of the mirror of the Transformers story. Transformers, we've been talking kind of broadly about the value of life, but it's also about the value of having someone to give life to and having someone to leave a world to, where I feel like Do a Power Bomb is about inheriting your life from your parent and honoring your parents' story while also being able to let them go. You know what I mean? Let them let yeah. them um, cease to be, which is like the scariest thing. I, I love my parents. I dread the day where I have to accept that they have ceased to be. These two stories are just great little like salt and pepper shakers to each other. And I feel like if you like Transformers and you like how he brings wrestling moves and, <laughs> and that action aesthetic to Transformers, you are going to lose your mind over do a power bomb it is astounding absolutely for sure so both of those comics are currently available on the omnibus omnibus is available as an app for your ipad and iphone as well as a beta for the android version the android version is in process and of course though if you don't have either of those things you've got a browser and if you have a browser you have access to the omnibus comic book store and it really is a comic book store you can build you know wish lists you know you, it's Basically, like building a wish list is like fulfilling your subscription box. And you can now sort, filter, group by series and change the view mode in your collection, Lisa. Ooh, so now we can share omnibus virtual shelfies? Yeah, do that. And we'll share ours as well on our socials. Another thing that I feel like we don't say enough about omnibus is you don't pay anything to go to Omnibus. Like it's just like it's literally just like a comic book store. You walk in for free, and if you want to, you can walk out for free. You don't have to buy anything. Yeah, yeah. It's super cool. It's super cool. Uh, and that's gonna bring us to the end of our referrals. And now let's bring Daniel Warren Johnson into our love nest to talk about Transformers. I have to say this one thing <laughs> before we just roll out or roll in, I should say. Um, I make a grievous error in this interview. Longtime listeners know I have a real hard time with proper nouns. And usually Brad is really kind and sweet and can edit around it. But in this interview... I say Autobots when I meant Decepticons, and there's just no there's just no getting around it. The way I, that I screwed this it up, tortures you. I it's lie such awake a at tiny night. moment, Lisa. Yeah, but I mean, so so anybody who does interviews can relate to this. Just share my pain for a moment. Like I said that thing wrong. I get this really thoughtful answer that is a little bit confused by what I said, but. But, like, Dan is extremely generous and is like, oh, I can see where you're coming from with that wrong thing that you said. <laughs> and then when I had realized my error, I was not able to to word the question correctly the second time around. So I end up getting not the answer I really want. So it's just embarrassing. Well, the answer you really want is what we explored in the introduction of this conversation. We just had it, Lisa. The answer that I really want is an A on my paper and a hug from my mom, but you can't always get it. Uh, you've got a hug or two from dad. Oh, I, oh, I have. Let's yeah, brag yeah, about it. Yeah. <laughs> Those are nice warm arms. Uh, all right. So with we, we all understand your mistake, Lisa. We don't <laughs> hold it against you. You know what Autobots are. You know what Decepticons are. <laughs> yeah, you know, like I would, I would feel more confident if Decepticons spent more time actively deceiving. You sure. know what I mean? They're pretty I, straightforward I, I, with I, their I, intentions. I think, I think, I think they do some. I, do, I think they do some deceiving. Anyway, let's get to our chat with Daniel Warren Johnson. 
Dan, welcome back to Comic Book Couples Counseling. Hello. Hello. Is this a video recording or just an audio recording? Just, just an audio. audio. If you want to continue doing yoga, it might sound strange, but nobody will see it. <laughs> oh, I totally am going to keep doing yoga. <laughs> <laughs> One of the great joys of your first arc of Transformers was discovering the connection between Sparky and Optimus Prime. I think my own biases expected this to be a story about Spike and Optimus Prime. How did you end up arriving with this being your kind of central uh, human Autobot relationship? Well, I was, um, I won't lie. I was trying to do a little bit of a swerve, no pun intended. Um, I knew everybody was maybe expecting Spike to take the main front and center of the story. And I didn't necessarily, <laughs> when I first pitched my like initial idea to uh, Robert and Sean over at Skymount, it was uh, Optimus and Sparky was kind of the two interpl the interplay that I was most excited about showing. And then Spike kind of fit in later. And I had no idea that Spike honestly was going to get shot. <laughs> halfway through the story um but it just you know it, that happened and it was actually a really nice pivot so i kind of like soft introduced sparky at first and then by the time spike is injured sparky has re-entered this situation in a way that hopefully is like natural and is a bit of a swerve and kind of takes us into a, into a different narrative direction that that people maybe thought was going to happen with spike so that was the goal from the beginning but how I, I got there was kind of a bit of a discovery for sure to me it's a story about optimus prime teaching like reteaching sparky what it means to be a dad and like how you actually are a father what makes you go like okay optimus prime he's like the ultimate dad like what what made you think that well i guess it's kind of just the vibe that i've always gotten from the character and i am going off mostly the television show and the uh, 86 movie, for sure, which I've been very open about. It's, it's kind of been my creative Bible. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I just, for me at least, Transformers has always worked best in my mind, narratively, when humans are in the picture. Uh, it just helps kind of ground everything in a way that I feel is more relatable. Um it just makes the stakes seem a little more uh, uh, tactile. And, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's a opinion that uh, everybody shares, but that's just kind of how I was able to get my way into the story. So um, when it came to Optimus as a dad, I was like, well, that's definitely a relatable concept that I can kind of take literally to a human relationship. So why not, you know? It was one of the lower hanging fruits, but not in a bad way. <laughs> you know, it was just like easily reachable. It was there, you know, and it's like so. It was so kind of, uh, oh yeah, this makes sense. Like I was almost like maybe I shouldn't do that, but then I was just like, no, let's just lean in because it's just there, and it hasn't, in my opinion, it just hadn't been done with this much kind of um, transparency, you know. Yeah, I just don't feel like, I just don't feel like pretending, you know, or like. Hey, is this about anything else? No, it's not. Yeah, have a good time. <laughs> I do think that it is kind of a, a, a revelatory take on 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 fatherhood and the idea of like you can't you can't act like when you make a person, they you have so little say on who they become. And when you have a person, you're not all of a sudden going to have all of this wisdom, you know, <laughs> to impart to them. But what you're imparting to them is just this spark and they're going to carry on your spark. And like, to me, like if Optimus Prime is like the ultimate dad, right? That makes like the Autobots like anti, anti-family. What do the Autobots represent for you? Um, I guess they kind of, the way I was kind of treating them, at least in the first arc, and that's evolved as I'm writing the second arc, but um they've it's kind of like like they're optimist's children and uh that's a little bit how optimist treats them and um which i think you know some of them may resent later on in the story mm -hmm. um just like a teenager might resent their father but in my story in the canon you know i was just kind of treating optimist like he's the one that's been fighting the longest he's the one that has the most wisdom mm -hmm. um he's seen 
fellow uh, Autobots go down in battle uh, because of their own making or because of Decepticons or what have you. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's wrestling with a lot of things at once. And, you know, there's many facets, obviously, I think, to his character. But the one that we focused on in the first arc is fatherhood. And as we move on to the second arc, you know, it's uh, it, it, it we'll, we'll focus on other things, not just that, because that's that that kind of uh, vibe has been kind of uh, wrestled with and, and has come to a kind of natural conclusion. And we'll see where we go from there. I think I said the opposite of what I meant. I think I said uh, Autobots when I meant to say Decepticons. He, he I did it all the freaking time. And it is very frustrating. <laughs> bad. And their name sounds bad. But the Autobots sounds neutral. And so I actually. <laughs> so you were saying the Decepticons. Yeah, the Decepticons represent to you. Mm, oh, that's a lot. That's a lot simpler. That's um, we needed bad guys. Mm -hmm. They are the bad guys. And especially with Starscream at first glance is an absolutely abysmal uh never able to be saved character that shall you know uh have no redemption whatsoever um and i don't really write i try not to write characters like that too often but i'm also was trying to celebrate who care who starscream is as like a character as well so i can just kind of be honest with what the what is there um and i don't feel like i didn't just didn't feel like you know there's no two sides to this coin here you know like starscream is He's such a mover and a shaker in that way. He's really fun to write. So um, I can't say much more than that without giving things away. But, sure. Um, you know, when when we talk about the Decepticons, I can't help but think Starscream because mm -hmm. like all Transformers lore, any like team book, if you have everybody having like a, a very clearly brought out like personality in 20 pages of story, you end up getting like this convoluted mess. You know? <laughs> like, sorry to bring it back to this, but like in pro wrestling, you know, you have time for like five angles, maybe, <laughs> right. um, you know, things have to kind of come out and come in and come into focus, come out of focus. So when it comes to the Decepticons, you know, at least for the first arc, they were the catalyst for, for the destructive force. That's kind of like, I guess in our lives that we just kind of have to deal with. And the Autobots are there to kind of deal with it. Um, and it's not until arc two that we've kind of delved more into what it means to be a Decepticon, I guess I have to say. So what's interesting about your first arc of Transformers, though, is how Prime seems to be in an evolution regarding his relationship with the Decepticons. And, you know, he's talking to Sparky at one point and he says, like, when he looks into a mirror, like he sees his enemy. He he and the Decepticons, like, it feels like he is closer to them than he's ever been before and more understanding of them than he's ever had before. And we get to the end of this arc. And when Soundwave, you know, uh, is there, he's still willing to uh, consider reunification, uh, but he's mm -hmm. also not a chump. And when a, a punch gets thrown, he's going to catch it and he's going to take care of Soundwave if he needs to. Right. You hit the nail on the head. <laughs> okay. I've explained the comic. I've explained the comic for everybody. Um, but, you know, so I guess, again, it's like, what is the desire there to try to uh, explore that side of Optimus Prime, of he is willing to accept reunification with the Decepticons. Well, I guess the age old, uh, never say never. Um, I think that's part of who Optimus is as a person or as a, a, a being, I guess I should say. He does feel like a living, breathing thing in some of the universe, honestly. So it's almost like I'm trying to peer through the clouds and see like who he really is. Like, uh, I don't know. Were you thinking about like that famous Peter Cullen quote where he talks about getting inspiration from his brother, uh, you know, being strong through or being uh, strong enough to be gentle? Yes. You know, I had definitely seen it. That was in Toys That Made Us, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was in a documentary series. I saw that years and years ago. And I definitely, I'm sure, you know, it, it definitely was part of it, but I wasn't actively thinking about it. I think there was just a, a an element of, um, I don't know. Maybe it, I, 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 I wasn't not thinking about that quote, but it's not like I had that in my mind as I was writing this, this story. I, I think you know, there's an element of just like this is just the character that I've kind of made him to be in my head since I was a little kid. Like, if I hadn't heard that Peter Cullen quote or that story, like, I would feel the same way. I'm 99 percent sure I would. You know, like, and I think I'd write him the same way too. There's an element of um, 
just like uh, truth there, just to the visual design of the character, the way that he was on screen on the TV show, as, as silly as that sounds, and in the movie, and it's weird. Like I said before, like he's like he's in the clouds. <laughs> it's, it's like uh, Simba. Like, what do you mean, father? You don't run a do 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 do. Sorry. I want to think a little bit about what it means for Sparky to walk into the Matrix. Sure. Because, like, at the beginning, in the very first issue, Davy has like a mini intervention with Sparky, saying, "Like, hey, you have to be there for Spike, right? You have you have to be physically and emotionally present because you know he you're." You know, he's your kid. Later, Sparky does the thing that makes him not physically present for his son. And like, and I feel like it 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 is kind of like a parallel instance to like Starscream cannibalizing Skywarp, going like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to take like I guess for me, like it's just very complicated. Like, wh- what does it mean to you? Sparky walking into the and how is it separate from cannibalizing Skywarp? Besides, like consent is really important, but I guess yeah. Well, uh, there's an element of um, you know, well, I guess a good point, I guess. Um, two 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 things that kind of happen to give uh life. Um, I guess you know, I think one thing I'm wrestling with, I've always wrestled with. This isn't this is an ongoing problem with writing transformers and including humanity is like yeah I, you know i don't want to do like too much of the michael bay like human humans like just barely making it out of out of like the robots grasp and time like happening a hundred times in a story where the point where like all the humans will be dead by now gosh darn it you know um i'm always trying to figure out a way to give humans agency in this like crazy massive things that are happening um and a lot of times that means I'm trying to find ways to uh, bring them more in line with like just what the Transformers are doing and like figuring out plot devices that can uh, have them be hand in hand together, either problem solving or coming to a, some sort of a conflict. And with Sparky walking into the Matrix, that was my way to try and infuse humanity into the uh, Autobot lore forever. Um, Mm. and that will take time to figure out what that looks like. Um, and of course can't spoil anything, but you know, that was me trying to tie them together spiritually and physically for the rest of, uh, the story for however long it goes. And that'll always be there now. Um, and so, you know, it was a thing that like Sparky felt like he had to do and he kind of, he saves the day. He, he's able to give Optimus an avenue to heal himself and save the Autobots. And hopefully the world, he sees Optimus as that father figure, you know, he sees what he wants to be. He sees what he was, he sees what he is now and what he wants to try to be. And he kind of has that, like, uh, you know, uh, he has that, that connection with Optimus now where he's like, I know what, I I know my sacrifice is going to pave the way for the sacrifice that fathers have to make all over the world. I guess. I don't know. I don't want to get too crazy with it, but, um, you know, that's kind of what was in my head. Uh, and the, the thing with Skywarp is, in, is interesting. Uh, but we haven't seen the last of Skywarp either. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite moments is the moment between Optimus Prime and Sparky. And, you know, like Sparky goes, like, Okay, well, it's up to the, the great spark now. I, you know, I can't do anything more for Spike. We're just going to see how what happens. Like, Sparky is like, shocked that um optimus prime has faith in something bigger and he goes like are you talking about gods because i was like pretty sure that you were a god and (laughs) and then optimus prime goes that's so funny because i could say the same thing about you yes And, and i have like i have my way that i'm interpreting it that connects back to the first issue but could you talk can you talk you share your head canon about the book you wrote and then i'll share mine that's fine well the scene was again you know by optimus acknowledging how powerful humans can be that was another kind of nod to how important are in the story um because kind of like when optimus says something like (laughs) uh in this story like everybody kind of listens and was like oh yeah yeah for sure you're totally right you know because i'd like to think that most of what he says is dead on um 
he's not a guy that makes a lot of mistakes and he doesn't really, he doesn't shoot from the hip. And when he says something, he means it. And, you know, small, but mighty, he tells Sparky, um, which is a little bit like, Hey, check it out. These humans are going to be here for a while. Um, and also just an acknowledgement of, of, of truth that uh, Optimus has for Sparky, you know, and, and furthers their emotional connection, hopefully as we head towards the conclusion of arc one, but yeah, but what, what are you vibing? To me, it takes me back to that first issue and Spike explaining to him, oh, what are parents? Well, parents made me. You know what I mean? That idea of like, well, there was nothing and then there was my parents and then there was me, right? You know, like this idea that that is how the spark is passed in humanity where it's just like we make more of ourselves where I feel like with Transformers, it's a little bit more like and. I, I wasn't, and then there was a spark, and then I was, you know? So, like, that idea of there's no, like, there's no degree of separation between the all spark and, well, well, not the all spark, but, like, the the great spark, I forget what it's called, and the Transformers, but there are many degrees of separation between humanity and our spark or whatever, our god or whatever. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I... I... Yeah, that's true. I think um they're figuring out how to um deal with like all of the stuff that and all of the lore that's come before with Transformers. You know, I I do have to be a little uh you know, I have to be a little gray about it. Um mm-hmm. because <laughs> one thing I've learned it's like um, you know, there's a lot of different ways things can be interpreted and so I have to kind of dance around things maybe that I wouldn't normally like with the spark and stuff, there's like a million different ways it's been done in the past, like with the movies and with um, the comics and IEW and Marvel and all this stuff. And uh, it's not super clear how it all works. So it's something that I'm working at, you know, but like we kind of have to like pick away at it because I, I can't like come out with like, this is how it works. Uh, right. There's a little bit of like hints and, and, and little like, like, like an onion peeling away the layers. Um, but the concept of having some sort of higher power, I would like to think is uh, very much consistent between Cybertronian and human. So that's what I would say. When uh, we first spoke about Transformers, you were talking about how you have a healthy distance between the pro- between Transformers and yourself. And that's different from, you know, your connection with do a power bomb or murder Falcon or extremity or anything like that. Uh, did you maintain that kind of distance throughout the process of doing this first arc uh, or did it evolve? I think that I can only get so close with things. If I'm being totally honest, you know, um, you know, it's just a reality. It's just like, uh, it's kind of like, you know, I don't own these characters. Um, and the, I am, uh, my creative decisions are in tandem with what, you know, Hasbro and Skybound want. And that's okay. That's just the way it is. But because of that, and because of the knowledge of that happening, I just have to, um, you know, pull back a little and be more reserved with how I treat the characters and how I kind of view them in my own kind of mind. So, you know, every once in a while you get moments which like really shine where like, I feel like I am super invested in those other moments where it's like, okay, this is um, not my, these aren't my characters. And I think it's important to be aware of that. Just, it's just the very nature of making stuff of that's just, I don't own, which is a lot of comic book making, which is why, you know, I love writing and drawing my own stuff the most because it is the hardest. And like with that distance, you know, it's like, there's an element of like, okay, I can kind of take it easy a little bit. Not like I'm not trying hard when I make Transformers, but because I don't, I don't have ownership in it. There's an element of uh, there's. It's easier to let things go and be healthy with it. Um, <laughs> with, with something like do a power bomb, you know, that's so invested in my soul, psyche, and physical body. If something happens with it, or I can't figure something out, or a panel looks wrong, I'm just banging my head against the wall. So, which is not healthy. And <laughs> there's some sort of middle ground here where I can treat my own stuff more like I would treat a book that I don't own, but sure. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> so what's the experience now that Jorge Corona h- has stepped up to the drawing table? Yeah, it's pretty freaking fun. Um, yeah. He is an incredible storyteller. Like he knows how to tell a story. So in some ways, maybe he, 
<laughs> he could write it too. Hey, like he's so because my scripts are not, I don't think they're sparse, but I'm not over here like explaining every shot, you know. I'm like close up, no close up, you know. There's a big uh there's a big fight scene that happens on this page. It's pretty loose. And he's carrying it. And he's 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 bringing it to the finish line in a way that um is honestly incredible to watch. He's so talented. He interprets what I'm writing in the best way. And we're on the same page. It's so exciting. It's like uh, you know, it's just how it it's just how it should work. I and mean, he's just like he is an all-star. And people mm-hmm. are gonna find out very soon just how handily he is taking these reins i mean like people do not need to worry we are in good hands with this guy holy cow yeah we're stoked to see what he does just the preview art that we've seen already we're really excited about it uh but it does make me wonder though like do you see this type of collaborative process uh, happening more in the future do you see yourself doing a lot more writing uh on the side <laughs> on the side on the let side. me tell you i'm trying to figure out how to write more and draw just as much and it's not going well (laughs) um i have thought about it more um you know working with someone like jorge is inspiring honestly um where i'm like jorge should we do an image book together (laughs) he's busy enough um but i have been writing more um and one thing you know writing for jorge the deadlines have been pretty intense so it's forcing me to be good at like uh, getting into writing and getting out of writing so I can start drawing. And I'm much better at uh, just writing for two hours, say, what have you, um, every day, uh, every weekday. And um, with that discipline comes an added level of, um, you know, thoughts and ideas about what else could be. And I am writing a book that someone else is drawing about 80% of. Uh, and I'm drawing about 20 that's that's a creator on books so that'll be coming out probably september this year so keep an eye out in july for an announcement and uh i am so excited about it i'm so proud of it already it's gonna be another banger yay awesome well you know we're we're down for it already uh dan thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to talk transformers today thank you for allowing me to do some yoga while talking to you yeah <laughs> anytime do what you gotta do friend do what you gotta do i'll talk yeah. to you soon and we'll talk i'll hit you up when uh the new book comes out if you want to talk about it yes, Hell yes of course no fresh of course we do open love nest anytime <laughs> okay all right take care bye guys I love talking to Daniel Warren Johnson about his comics, and I really appreciate how he receives generously all of our essay questions. I do have the helium taken out of my balloon a little bit at one point in this conversation when I postulated to Dan that, like, the reason Optimus Prime sees us as gods, our godlike, is because we make our family. Like, Transformers don't, you know have sex and give birth. Like it's this completely foreign idea to Optimus Prime. And um, Dan couches his response to that in, well, there is existing lore to how Transformers are made. And he just doesn't really touch on it in this story. And like in the moment I was like, ooh, I'm wrong. (laughs) You know what I mean? I got a big red X, you know, on my answer. It's not like I was like, offended but it just gave me an opportunity to re-engage with my principle of like I come to the story with what I come come to the story with and the answers I take from the story have as much to do with me as they do with the story like you only engage with what's on the page right. right so if Dan's not bringing in the lore and you're unaware of the lore you're not engaging with that lore there is no right and wrong Necessarily, when I'm when I'm responding to the story, um, just because there's a piece of information that I don't have, I f- I feel like um, a lot of new readers to comic books can be intimidated by that factor, where where there is power in knowing so much and being encyclopedic, but I think that there is also power in coming to a story fresh. But even knowing the lore doesn't negate necessarily what you were trying to explore with your idea. I think Optimus Prime does have a fascination with humanity because of what humans are and their brittleness and their concept of family and how it's different from the Cybertronian way. Yeah. Like 
our pretty much only like sit and talky scene between Spike and Optimus Prime is about the idea of family yeah. and where families come from. And when we had this conversation with Dan, we had not yet read Transformers 7. And yes. so we did postulate to him where this story could be going and we didn't want him to actually answer, but he has now answered with Transformers 7. And we do see that when Sparky walked into the matrix of leadership, he did become a part of, of Optimus Prime. In issue seven, Prime seems to be having memories that only Sparky could have. So it doesn't seem to be a literal death. Yeah, like it, like it's a, it's a transformation. Yeah. And it's going to make now Prime's relationship with Spike very, very complicated. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Yeah. If we had had more time, I also would have really enjoyed talking about Carly's role mm -hmm. in this story and how it has evolved from the first issue. And Carly right now is in a very dark place. But I like this friendship that Daniel Warren Johnson has created between Carly and Cliff Jumper, even though like right now it's a little antagonistic because Cliff Jumper had the opportunity to kill Starscream and chose not to because he's had enough death in his life. Mm -hmm. And Carly can't quite understand that because Carly has not lived the centuries of war that Cliff Jumper has lived. And her pain is so, so fresh. New. Yeah. So yeah. fresh. And like it's interesting to watch her now kind of take a a Decepticon kind of view of like math. Yeah. Fairness. Yeah. Yeah. Equality. Justice. Yeah, um, justice. Yeah. I'm gonna get my vengeance. So, yeah, I, and, and I really am enjoying Jorge Corona on art. It's yeah. very, it's not extremely different from what Daniel Warren Johnson was doing in his run, but it's it's slightly askew. I think it's a great match uh, pair for the first art. Yeah, it's a new perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, oh my goodness, Soundwave and Starscream, what happened in issue seven? Yeah. Soundwave, I'm loving it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so issue seven, out now, the trade paperback of issue seven. Issue one is coming out mid-May. Be on the lookout for that. And uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap up our Transformers conversation with Daniel Warren Johnson. But Daniel Warren Johnson will be back on our next episode. A year ago, we had a conversation with him about one of his favorite single issues, the nom number nine from Marvel Comics. And we made that a Patreon exclusive conversation. It was the beginning of our Married to Singles Patreon series, where we bring in comic book creators to talk about some of their favorite comics. We've had Christian Ward on talking about Arkham Asylum. Uh, we just had John Harris Dunning on to talk about Spider-Woman number 50. And it all began with Daniel Warren Johnson talking about the nom number nine. And Lisa and I are going to be in Chicago for C2E2 next week. And we thought this was a great time, an opportunity to bring that Patreon episode and unlock it and bring it into the main feed. Speaking of C2E2, if you are going to be there, please, please, please come to our panel on Friday at 345 in room S405B. We'll be talking superhero relationships, why we love them so much. It is your opportunity to get up and talk to us about the, the comic book couples that you love. We make it a real laid back, fun comic book couples counseling time. Yeah, we've only done it once before at AwesomeCon. This will be the second comic book couples counseling panel and we're super excited about it. And nervous that nobody's gonna show up. <laughs> so please bring a friend, bring several. And for those of you who are wondering when this Schema episode is happening that we have been promising for weeks, I had a dental emergency this week. <laughs> I am grinding my teeth and my, my teeth are literally falling out of my head. Yeah. It is a waking nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go to C2E2, come back, get a couple crowns oh and God. really, really commit to, to wearing that like teeth grinding thing. Yeah, the guard. Uh, this Mouth is also guard. a great opportunity to promote our Patreon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> you know, a dollar a month, $12 a year. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, think about it. Think about yeah, it. Yeah. We got bills to pay. <laughs> so many bills to pay. And you won't just be supporting us. You're going to get hours and hours and hours of content that has been before not unlocked to you. That's a sentence I chose to say it that way. Okay, Brad. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. <laughs> um, here's the where the transition goes. Okay. Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on most social medias at Mouthdork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show posters, send them to Karen Chap at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I'm always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to get more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Apple Podcasts, or whatever app you prefer. We're everywhere. If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. Patreon, Patreon, Patreon. Lisa's dental bills. (laughs) Uh, Lisa needs braces. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on all the socials at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Audible or Apple Podcasts, and if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? Yes, please. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. And roll out. That's not how we do it. That's a good pausing place so for me to gather my thoughts. <laughs>